Welcome to another episode of the Sachin and Adam Show. This was a particularly special episode because Vinnie Pooji, who was our guest today, came all the way from New York City. I'd love to say he came for us, but he was coming to Australia for some business, but we were able to intercept him and have a great interview. And one of the reasons why we wanted to interview him is that we're doing an America tour early next year. We're going to be hitting the ground in the States, going across New York, Miami, San Fran, interviewing the best founders and investors we can. And before we do that tour, we wanted to interview as many Americans virtually, just to get to know the land, get to know the people before we hit the ground. And so we're very fortunate to be able to interview someone who's one of the biggest young guns in America. Vinny Pooji is someone who left Insight Partners at the early age of 27 years old to start Left Lane Capital. This is now one of the leading growth consumer investment firms in the world. Last year, it was actually rated in the top 25 growth equity firms in the world, which is just a remarkable feat. He's intelligent, he's inspiring, and we loved hearing about his story. And hopefully when we go on our America tour, we can do a round two with Vinny in person in New York City. Hope you enjoy it. We are super excited to announce that you'll be joined on this episode by our first sponsor, Recess, the furniture startup. So Recess sells everything you need for your home and office, and they've sent us one of their products, which is their office chair. And oh my God, it is the most comfortable thing I've ever sat in. I'm actually really jealous of Sachin because I had a feel in it and it is incredibly comfortable. It makes you more productive and I'm stuck on this chair, which is about to break at any minute. Recess has helped thousands of Aussie startups, including the likes of Eucalyptus, Afterwork and Leica. They also have enterprise customers such as Mervac. How you feel when you're working really matters for your productivity and just for your health as well. So if you want to get fitted out with some furniture, whether it's an ergonomic chair or a soundproof box, let us know. We've got discounts for B2C customers for 20%. And if you're a B2B customer, let us know and we'll sort you out. And we didn't want to tell you this because it's not peer reviewed yet. But ever since I've sat in this chair, it's increased my productivity by 300%. Welcome back to the Sachin Adam Show. Now today we have the honor to have our first ever international guest sitting in our studio. Now we like to say Vinny flew all the way from New York to be here with us today, <laughs> but- I did. <laughs> what do you mean I did? There you go, here I am. <laughs> maybe, maybe there were some other meetings in the agenda as well, but we are stoked to have one of the co-founders of Left Lane Capital, Capital Vinny Pucci. Yeah, super stoked for you to be here, Vinny. And thanks for coming all the way from New York today. Yeah, we thanks. really feel like rock stars because of that. Um, so I first heard, well, I saw Vinny was coming to Australia because of EVP, you were doing an event. And I've seen you on sort of Twitter before on LinkedIn, and I knew a little bit about Left Lane Capital. And I think what really struck me about you was that you spent six years at Insight, um, straight out of uni, and then started this VC fund that now has over $2 billion of assets under management. And I think when I sort of shared him with Sachin, we're like, wow, this guy has had such a crazy yeah, I feel like you're not that much older than us and like yeah. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> we're we're 24 no I'm 30 okay yeah, yeah. we got six years to catch up yeah. um but I remember Adam showed me your profile and we both had this massive amount of imposter syndrome because like Jesus this guy's done a lot yeah and then we're super stoked for you um to be able to come here and come on the podcast and we did quite a lot of research as we do with all of our guests and the thing that sort of we got most excited about was that on your wedding day you created a rap song for your wife and I was saying this before that like often when you see these things like oh I might be a little bit cringe he's not going to be that good at singer at singing but you were like really really good and I shared this around to the group chats like people not even <laughs> in tech and they're like wow this is um really impressive so how did that come about where did you learn to rap and where does that come from so from the ages of zero to 11 i lived in st louis missouri and at that time in st louis a group called the saint lunatics were really big and if you lived in st louis that time you were listening to rap and that really started with nelly and that's the guy who made you know it's getting hot in here just so a drink the, uh yes <laughs> years years and years later yeah that's not what i would associate but um when you grow up in a city like St. Louis and you're not the default color that a lot of people are, you just kind of assimilate to the other color, which in St. Louis, you're either white or you're black. They don't have that nuanced of a view. And I actually think that, you know, some people think that's like a faux pas or something like that to say, but I think it's an interesting thing because a lot of people as first generation Americans come to a new country and they have to assimilate and, in the classroom, to be honest, I acted like the best and brightest and most polished white kids. And outside of the classroom, most of my friends were black kids and I would hang out with black kids. And even more than that, I had two older brothers and they loved hip hop. They were DJs, that's how they made money throughout high school. And I was given this 
gift of falling in love with a certain type of music, but I'm not the type of person to be a fan of something without trying to do it myself because my ego is that big, right? Or maybe I just like the sound of my own voice. So genuinely, from the time I was six, seven years old, I was scribbling, you know, raps on pieces of paper. And if you met me as a 15, 16 year old, and you grew up around where I grew up, you were probably listening to my music, playing them in your high school parties, maybe listening to me on the radio. And then the second I went to college, I completely dropped it. And then, you know, credit to my now wife, when, when we were dating, she, I kind of let her discover the fact that I used to make rap music and she loved it. She's like, you have to do this. You have to do more. And she, one time she bought me studio time and I made a bunch of songs, never published them anywhere, right? <laughs> just for myself, just for fun. And, uh, and when we got engaged, maybe the next week, she was like, so are you going to do a rap at the wedding? And I was like, no way am I doing a rap at my wedding. <laughs> and then three weeks before the wedding, it just kind of, I don't know, it struck me. And I was like, you know what? She asked for it. She's planned this entire Indian wedding, right? It's a super white girl, if you've ever seen a photo of my <laughs> wife, California girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. She just planned this amazing multi-day Indian wedding. I got to do something. I got to surprise her with something. And I love a good surprise. So, you know, I wrote the wedding rap. Awesome. It's a yeah. sensational video. And we'll definitely put a link to it at the bottom of um, the video. Why, why did you stop it in uni, though? If you were so passionate, it was being played around the place. Um, I think you're you're definitely influenced by what's around you. And the second I got to college, I, so I went to Penn. I was Wharton undergrad. I did something called the Huntsman Program. Suddenly there were so many new things for me to do that, frankly, I just got distracted. And the people I used to make music with were no longer, you know, right down the street from me. Um, and that's actually when I stumbled into the, I guess, second passion, extracurricular, whatever you want to call it, to, to piss off my parents, which was starting companies, right? So um, I, I dropped out of school after two years because I was so obsessed with starting companies. And I had started a business with some friends and I was growing it. Um, but that, anyway, that was my uh, pursuit to explore. I don't really think I'm the type of person who can have more than one extracurricular at a time. Mm. We'll, go, we'll get into those companies for a second, but I want to explore that kind of early upbringing for a little bit. So you said yeah. you had kind of had these black friends out of school and you went to this private school and you were very academic. How do you think that like duality um, shaped who you are today? Yeah, and I don't want to say like oh, I had black. <laughs> I, had, I had friends of, yeah. of every single color. I, I'm I'm, a, I'm an equal opportunity friend haver, <laughs> um, and uh, I I don't know. Again, I I think some people feel limited by it. I always found it to be a gift that I could walk into any room and kind of choose who I wanted to be to mm. a certain extent. Right. So people, of course, like if I walked into a room and I had a thick Indian accent, or if I, you know, carried myself a certain way, they would assume they would go back to this, they would revert to the mean assumption. Oh, that's, you know, that's an Indian guy fresh off the boat, whatever. And they would have assumptions about that. People are always going to assume things about you. Um, but I think one of the beauties of growing, growing up in a community that has actually, frankly, done well, if you look at Indian Americans in the US, I think it's the highest GDP yeah, per capita is. group. Mm. And if you have a turban, People kind of know that, you know, you're you're probably a generally well-to-do person in the U.S. And you probably come from a family who cares, uh, who at least cared to teach you the, the history, traditions, culture, religion, all that stuff. And in our little industry, it's done nothing but open doors for me. Um, and so I never found it or experienced it like a duality. I just said, I get to choose who I want to be. So in some ways... You know, I'm going to borrow from this culture and other ways I'm going to borrow from that culture. And some people describe that to me, like feeling like they're lost and stuck between multiple worlds. And for me, maybe it's, you know, it's not surprising that I'm also a nomad at heart. I love traveling. I feel like I live everywhere. I feel like I am everyone. So I never found a need to be one thing or another. Mm, that's awesome. Taking a bit from every culture, well, yeah. whatever you can appreciate. Why not? So you mentioned like the sort of second extracurricular thing was starting businesses. Yeah. What was the moment where you had that sort of spark when you realized like that was your thing? I'm going to drop rapping now. Now it's time to do business. Uh, man, I wish I could pretend that I was that purposeful about things. Um, 
So I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, my dad was an entrepreneur. He did everything from mortgage brokerages to construction to he ran a travel agency for multiple years. He even created what I would deem to be one of the, you know, OG digital currencies. Like he, wow. he, he created this network where small businesses would uh, share credits with each other. So if you were a carpet cleaner, um, you could get an electronic if you had, you know, a business token and, and he created this cashless system. So he's, sure he's not Satoshi. I know, right? <laughs> no, his, his, his name is Raminder Puji, but uh, you know, not that different from <laughs> Satoshi. Um, no, he, he's just super entrepreneurial and would always push us to think about businesses. And then my oldest brother's a lawyer, but super business savvy. His uh, wife, Pyle, started ClassPass. It was a great story to watch unfold. Very, I think, category-defining company. My middle brother, like me, went to Wharton, uh, worked at McKinsey, worked at a hedge fund, started and sold multiple companies. And I think that I was given an incredible gift of mentors and seeing people try different industries and all that stuff. So I really didn't pull this out of thin air. My whole life, I was frankly being groomed to think about businesses, start businesses, invest in businesses from, I don't know, honestly, I have memories from being seven years old and my brother teaching me, you know, about an income statement. Mm. Um, so it, I, I think I was given a lot of guidance to getting into that world. How would your parents describe you versus the rest of your siblings? If you zoom out, we are so hilariously similar. I mean, wow. we even have the same voice box. I can, <laughs> I, I can fool any one of my brother's spouses into thinking that I am them wow. easily. But the way our parents would describe us is that our oldest brother, Nick, is highly pragmatic, very structured thinker, unsurprising that he's the lawyer. They would describe Jesse as being much more um, uh, aggressive in business, um, ruthless at times and at the same time you know very uh emotional and sensitive uh, underneath it all um i don't know how they would describe me you'd have to ask my brother you're the, pro you the problem younger child or I, I i think i was mostly the opposite so my mm. brothers growing up they got arrested for stuff you know i, I mentioned <laughs> they were djs like they got arrested drag racing on an airport strip one time <laughs> they threw crazy parties i actually got put in private schools and all different types of everything growing up because my brothers were such bad kids. <laughs> and it's funny to say now because they're so incredibly successful, but growing up they were really bad kids <laughs> and, and they got in trouble constantly. And so to be honest, we, we all kind of turned out the same. They would describe me in, in being different as the one who absolutely loves to travel, the one who just gets happy every time he lands in a new place. Um, but other than that, honestly, we're kind of the same. Mm -hmm. And a really big part of your journey is obviously going to Insight. But before yeah. that, you were starting companies in uni. You ended up dropping out fairly early. Why didn't you follow that path of just staying and being an entrepreneur versus going to work at a growth equity fund? And I guess for the audience, Insight is a fund that has invested probably like 20, it's got $20 billion of assets under management. It's more. probably got more. Yeah. It's got some of the best talent in the world goes to work there after uni. So it's extremely prestigious. But how did you choose that path? Versus founding. So um, when I, we started a company our sophomore year and my co-founder there, Ubi, uh, along with our good friend, Max, Ubi stayed an entrepreneur. So after a short stint at Apollo, he started another company and then another one, which is called Misfits Market. Misfits has grown to yeah. 2 billion valuation and Ubi's still one of my closest friends. We speak every week. We gave speeches at each other's weddings. Um, and I think it's great to follow these different paths. He was not bothered by the loneliness of starting a company. I really feed off the energy of other people. And uh, we had started this company our sophomore year where we basically, to take a step back, there's three types of companies that college kids usually start, or at least back in the day they started. You either started a food delivery company because you wanted food, you started a t-shirt company because your fraternity or sorority or whatever group wanted custom t-shirts for every event and every party and everything like that. Or you started a tutoring company and we started a tutoring company because we were nerds and we had perfect test scores and we said, hey, everybody's always asking us to tutor their kids. Let's just start a tutoring company. 
but we took it one step further. We had offices in four cities. 50% of our business was online. We built a lot of software. We built a lot of automation. And we had a network of tutors who also had perfect test scores uh, to teach kids. And we built a great profitable business. And uh, after about a year of running that business, and we had left school, um, <laughs> We left school after I got straight C's for one semester because I wasn't <laughs> paying attention in any of my classes because I was busy running a company. Um, my parents had this intervention with me and you would have thought that I was like, you know, holed up in a crack den taking, you know, huge amounts of drugs all day. Uh, but no, I was just running a business. Um, but my family, my parents do actually have a good amount of influence over me and I, I do care about their approval. Um, and so that affected me quite a bit. And I think Ubby's family had a, a similar chat with him. And uh, we ultimately said, okay, we could keep going this route, but probably makes sense to get this degree, check this box. And so we actually were boomerangs. We went back to school to get that degree for our parents and uh, frankly, get them off our backs. And I, I assumed that I was going to start a company immediately, but I ended up getting this internship at Insight Partners. And that was 10 years ago now. Um, and I, I, I kind of had fun in the internship. I thought, wow, I get to speak with entrepreneurs all day. This is so fun. And I thought back to when I was running my own business, I had previously worked for my brother in the Facebook advertising space. And a lot of entrepreneurs around us were starting to scale up their performance marketing. And I used to help them for fun. Funny enough, that's actually how I met my wife. I trained her in Facebook advertising. Um, <laughs> As you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, we, or, or at least I got so much joy from helping other people with their businesses. I didn't know it at the time, but that was the first sign that maybe this was the right path for me. And when I did this internship, I had fun. I t so I took the return offer. And uh, I figured, okay, I'll do this for a year, then I'll go start my next company. This is a great way for me to get to know different business models uh, for what I'm going to start next. And then I started sitting on the boards of companies, and I started helping them work through problems, hiring people, firing people, regulatory issues. And I realized that I was kind of scratching that itch that I had. I like dealing with problems. I never get upset when the founder calls me and they have problems. I, I really secretly, I just, I like dealing with all this stuff. But at the same time, having a portfolio from a selfish perspective, it kept me happy. When you're running a business and you lose a big customer, your heart sinks. Right? Especially, I was a 19-year-old kid running a company. I didn't have any life perspective. I didn't realize that life was going to go on. So it really hit me hard in those early days. And uh, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't scarred by that. So the fact that I got to nourish myself with all these entrepreneurial experiences while also having a portfolio and getting the joy of helping people. I mean, that just changed the game for me. And uh, as a 20, when we left Insight, I had just turned 27, but I had done 16 investments there. I was on nine boards. I had an unbelievable experience leaving Insight. And I have all the respect and, and appreciation in the world for Insight Partners um, and my former bosses there who are still close friends and confidants and all that. Um, and that's really what allowed us to, to do what we did. Mm. Diving kind of more into your experience and in insight for a second. This is something yeah. Adam and I are really curious about as kind of young investors. Yeah. What do you think that you learned about investing in insight that kind of accelerated your career to the degree where you could start a fund at the yeah. age of 27, which is when most people actually start their VC careers. Yeah, and fair. that's for the younger age as well. So um, when I joined insight, it was a 60 person firm. Today it's a 500 person firm. So obviously the firms had tremendous growth trajectory. But even when I left the firm, it was 120 people. So just in these last three, four years, their headcount is 4 x But in going from a 60 to 120 person firm, um, I saw Insight become an institution. So when I joined the firm, I don't think they had anyone dedicated to investor relations, maybe one partner. And now they have this big investor relations team. But seeing a firm be built like that while still maintaining its entrepreneurial core was extremely valuable. So that's just on the firm building side. On the investing type and the investing style, it's not a surprise that Left Lane's investing style uh, is very similar to Insight's. So we have an outbound strategy. At Insight, before any training, genuinely before any training, they just put you on the phones. Mm. And they said, call, call companies. And so you'd speak with a 1,000 companies a year, right? And if you spoke with 500 companies, you were the bottom of your class and you might not have a job next year. Right? So just speak with a ton of companies. And what's the result? 
at bats, right? That's what everybody would say. Just create at bats. And I remember like the first time I actually spoke with a good company, it was like, you know, the best moment ever. And I brought it to pipeline and the partner I was working for was like, this is not interesting for us. Right. And you learned why, Oh, it's a low gross margin business. Okay. And the next time you're super excited, Oh, it's a low retention business. Okay. And you just started to learn in that way through trial and error. And I really actually like that way of learning because in the same way that sometimes it's best to problem solve like a five-year-old and just try a bunch of things and fail quickly. I actually think that's the best way to get to know different business models and why something might be a good fit or a bad fit for certain firms. Um, so insight in that way is a great place to learn because they just put you on the front lines and you have to just do it. Mm. So what was their approach to relationship building? Because for a lot of like very early stage VCs, it feels very organic. Like you're going yeah. to events, you're meeting people, even at parties, and then it fosters a sort of a wider network. Were you literally like calling up people all day and trying to start the relationship from there and then seeing if it's sort of spurred on? Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that the, the firm's changed. But when I joined Insight, they were not in the circle of elite VCs. So all those VCs in San Francisco or on Sand Hill Road, they traded notes with each other. They traded deal flow with each other. And they really liked each other. And we were like these cowboys who would just cold call their companies mm -hmm. and then decide which ones we wanted to invest in. And half the times we were investing in companies that were bootstrapped. And I think that that was really good training because it's not really hard to get a coffee with a VC. It's not hard to go to a VC party, but it's kind of hard to harass someone who doesn't want to talk to you and <laughs> get them on the phone and then impress them as a 22 yeah. year old kid. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that I was one of the more extroverted VC networking type folks in my class because I just did one thing that my colleagues didn't do, which at the end of a phone call, I'd say, by the way, who led your last round? And they would say, Oh, you know, it was my friends at, uh, Cherry Ventures in Germany. I'd say, oh, I'd love to meet him. And so I, I met Philip at Cherry Ventures, right? And just one by one, I would build my VC network that way. And the funny thing was, for most of these firms, I was the first or maybe the second person at Insight they'd ever met, but they'd been reading about Insight because Insight kept growing. And then in the shadows, they kept doing more and more deals. Um, and then I would go to new geographies. So I did Insight's um, investing activity when I was there in India. So any investment... When I was there that was done in India was led by me. And it's really just because I got on a plane and I went to India. And my former boss, Devin Parekh, said, okay, yeah, sure, you can go to India. <laughs> and, uh, and so I used to go there once a quarter and I would invest in companies. And they were so welcoming of this outside VC that had, you know, a big AUM behind them. And, uh, and they were more than happy to meet and, and stay Ooh, networked can, with can them. Can we just dive into that for a second? So what would be your approach if you're going to India and – just trying to make companies, would you go down in Bangalore and just try and talk to people about where the next companies are coming from? Well, so to be fair, it started with an investment in charge B. Yeah. Cool. So not a bad one to have. I it's, it, I mean, lucky at the time charge B, the founders had been at it for five years and they had primarily raised capital from Excel India. And my now buddy Shaker was on the board there. Um, and he's an OG of, of Indian VC. Um, I think Tiger had put money in as well, but Tiger had sprayed money into hundreds of companies in India at the time. And I think that strategy worked pretty well for them. Um, but really, it was just an Excel portfolio company. And Indian VC firms, this is going back in time six years, they were really marketing. So you would meet the Indian VC and they would hand you a sheet with their portfolio companies organized by stage and traction and growth. They were marketing companies. Now, of course, now they've realized, wait a minute, a bunch of these firms had great returns and we should just raise bigger funds and we should do these deals ourselves. So now that we're a little bit more competitive with them, but we're still, you know, behaviorally, we're, we're very friendly with them. Um, I'd say it depends on the ecosystem, but assuming it's an ecosystem, and frankly, a lot of these ecosystems have reverted to being this way where there's not a ton of early growth or growth capital, you can kind of show up and everybody's going to welcome you with open arms. Why wouldn't they? But you need to make sure that you actually spend the time, go to the poker nights, get dinners with people so they don't treat you like the American asshole. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want to be the dumb foreign money that's there. So you want to make some real friendships. So the reason why I went there the first time for a week and not two days is because I knew I needed to actually make some friends there. And those people are still my friends to this day. 
Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> awesome. Keen to jump into left lane capital in a second, but I think there's an obvious trend in your life that you're a very hardworking, high-performing person. You hustled at Insight for years, doing all this cold calling. You said you're top of your class at Warden. You're creating businesses. You're a rapper. All this stuff. What were like these sort of underlying motivations in like the activities were you doing? Like, is there a sort of consistent thread about like what was from the base sort of motivating your behaviors? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I I actually go back to this immigrant thing. I think if you see that your parents moved to a different country to give you a better life and then they worked their butts off and they, you know, I think my dad worked at a pizza shop while he was putting himself through college and stuff like that. And you see how hard they work and where they came from and then the platform that they built for you. I at least feel a lot of responsibility. When I now for a quick break from the podcast. Now, Satch, we've been wanting to hire someone for a while, haven't we? Yeah, this editing is getting a bit tedious and I can see the bags under your eyes. Yeah, it takes a long time and on top of full-time work, it's, it's really difficult, but I wouldn't know where to start when we're hiring someone. Yeah, I actually met someone that does um, video and podcast editing when I was backpacking, but they live in the Philippines and if we tried to hire them, we'd probably break a law. <laughs> Look, that sounds like a great idea, but there's just so much paperwork to do when hiring someone. Yeah, honestly, I have no idea how to even get started. But we're lucky. We've got a solution here because our friends at Employment Hero have a new global teams product that helps you set up teams from around the world, even when you're not in the same physical location. Yeah. And what's even cooler is you get access to global talent teams, which really helps when trying to hire people from around the world. And it's pretty cool because the person who started all this was our friend, Ben Thompson. He is a friend of the podcast. He's Absolute been on the legend. show before. <laughs> Absolute legend. Um, and it's great to partner with him. And here's a kicker. We've actually spoken to Ben and we can get you the first month's management fee completely free. Um, all you have to do is go to Employment Heroes website, um, click request a demo and mention such an Adam and they'll sort you guys out. Now back to the episode. I see that. Um, and I've always felt that. I felt like, okay, you worked really hard to get from zero to one. Let me see if I can jump from one to three here. And it's a little bit illogical, but I actually don't believe in you know, building generational wealth. Because I think the right balance of platform, but still some hunger, platform without a safety net is really important. Mm. So, you know, I've discussed it with my wife like three weeks into dating. I was like, by the way, I'm not going to leave any money for our kids. And she was like, yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. So you decided you're having kids three weeks into dating? Yeah. Wow. I'm quick, man. <laughs> I was, three weeks into dating, I was like, by the way, my kids are going to look like me. They're going to be raising my religion, et cetera, et cetera. That's super oh, nice. great. Yeah. Love that. Um, yeah, so Vinny, I think this is a good time to transfer over to Left Lane. Let's do it. And I'm going to use a pun to introduce it. What was the insight that led you to starting Left Lane? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so when we were at Insight, a few of us raised our hands to join this effort that we ultimately dubbed Insight Next. So we had a four-person team. We sat in a different part of the office, and we were specifically investing in early growth internet companies. And Insight's core was late-stage enterprise software companies. So my first few years at Insight, I was doing classic growth equity, private equity deals. I did a take private of a New Zealand-listed company called Diligent. I did some other growth buyouts. And then I was like, okay, really interesting. I'm learning a lot, but there's no innovation here, right? Everybody knows exactly how enterprise software companies work, right? People have understood how they've worked for decades. The last innovation was the transition from license maintenance to SaaS, right? And now it's a little bit obvious. I can Google how to run a SaaS company. Chat GPT can tell me how to run a SaaS company. Internet companies were a little bit different. Some of them were SaaS companies, by the way, but they were more nuanced in that a lot of them were freemium or maybe they sold to consumers or maybe they were subscription or marketplace business models, but targeted at different audiences. They were not the classic boiler room enterprise sales uh, playbooks that were being run by the vistas of the world. And that was interesting to me. There was really one person at Insight who had invested in a lot of these companies and that's my now partner, Harley. So when Harley got the green light to you know, go off in the other part of the office, some of us joined, we had this four person team we invested in companies like the Farmer's Dog, the pet food company. And the Farmer's Dog this year is going to do, if not at, I think, above actually a billion dollars in revenue. And these are, these are multi-billion, if not trillion dollar categories that we were finding with good margins, nice retention, but not enterprise software. 
They were just enterprise software-like companies. And we also invested in companies like Chargebee, right? But when we invested in Chargebee, they had 2,000 customers, paying them on average 2,000 bucks a year, mostly just developers or people just starting their companies. And today, they have a few thousand more customers, but the average customer is paying them 20, 25,000 bucks a year. So we would help companies build more enterprise, but at the time of investment, we wanted to see lots of littles. What we found is these companies would come back to us and say, gosh, and this is, you know, let's say Calm, the meditation app. Gosh, nobody's ever pulled our 50 million row usage file. Nobody's ever correlated open times with retention rates or demographics with cost to acquire a customer or six month user behavior with likely lifetime value of a customer. Where'd you get these insights? And we're like, well, we just keep looking at companies like yours and we're finding patterns. But the fascinating thing to us was nobody else was doing that yet. And so we were winning about 90% of term sheets that we would put down. And we had a separate pipeline meeting, separate investment committee even, and we were running an independent sort of fund within the fund. And in 2019, we went back to our bosses and we said, hey, our performance is really good here. We have product market fit for this kind of niche that we stumbled into. And it was kind of businesses built here, right? Mm. Built on your phone um, or, you know, maybe in the app store. But the point being much more nuanced business models where marketing, lifecycle marketing, understanding the levers of the business, which were much more nuanced in enterprise software, was the opportunity. And we became obsessed with that opportunity. And eventually, uh, we, we were able to land in a negotiation point where we spun out of Insight. And so that, that team is in left lane is really a continuation of the strategy that we created while there. That's super exciting. And you obviously had a really good, unique insight there about these consumer internet companies. But you're also having to start a company yourself. Yep. There's things like hiring, the org structure, how you're going to use data, how did you think about creating a really great organization? Not just about the investing component, but the overall sort of view of what, what a good VC looks like. We didn't, and that was a huge mistake. Okay. I was shocked at how hard it was when we started because I grew up at Insight. As an investor, I really grew up there. You know, five, six years at the firm, I didn't know what it felt like to be at a solo shop or a small VC firm, what so many people inherently understand in this industry, I, I completely took that infrastructure for granted. So we had hired a couple of people out of the gate. And I remember one time we kind of sent over some company materials to someone and we said, let us know what you think. And they like sent back like a, a one word response or one sentence response. And we're like, wait, where's the KPI memo and where's the nicely organized bullet points and how, how do we make a decision here? <laughs> so suddenly we had to do, we, we thought we had hard jobs before. We had three jobs. And the three jobs were find companies, evaluate, and then ultimately invest in companies, which inherent in that is winning a deal. It's not always easy. And then manage companies. And I could not have imagined working harder than I worked at Insight. And then for that first year or two at Left Lane, I worked five times as hard. I mean, <laughs> truly, I, I, I could not have imagined how hard it was going to be. Um, and it's just because we, we had to add three more jobs, right? We had to add hiring people, building firm, building culture, training materials, all that stuff. We had to add raising funds. Mm. I think we met close to 1,000 LPs in the process of raising our funds. Wow. That means we got 950 no's, I think. We have some of the most elite investors in the world, university endowments, pension funds, and so forth, but still... You know, 95% of the time we heard a no, which was demoralizing, but also gave us tremendous empathy for companies raising capital. Um, and, and you have the, the need to build, um, gosh, I don't even know the, the right way to put it, but, but basically build the machinery behind the people. And I put those as two separate jobs uh, because, I mean, I'll put it this way. We haven't had anyone leave the firm in three plus years. We take a lot of pride in that. This is an industry with high churn. People get offers every day, but we built a firm that people care to stay at, that they feel like they're building. And at the same time, um, that means that I don't get to spend that much time investing in new companies because the number one responsibility is managing the portfolio. If a portfolio company emails me and I can't get back to them that day, I'm failing at my job, right? So if you're a 
venture back startup. And when you email your VC, it takes them a week to get back at you. That's a shitty VC. I'm sorry, but they do not deserve to do this job. You owe them your first, second, and third response of the day. And then it is actually all the other things on the company building side, the fundraising side, you know, uh, managing your investor base. And only then do you get to think about new deals. So I didn't realize that so much of my job was actually going to be about building all this infrastructure to let other people be what I was at Insight, which are the deal quarterbacks and the deal proponents and, you know, build their careers. But now that I've realized that, I really enjoy it because I get to be back to where I'm happy, back to company building. Yeah, that, that, that's fascinating. And I think I'm calling it now. We're going to have to do a round two because I know we're, we're running up on the clock. Um, before we dive into the quick fires, I've got one kind of last uh, question around left lane. You speak a lot about kind of seeking businesses that become utilities. Yep. Um, you spoke about Uber in the early days, Calm, which is one of your uh, portfolio companies. Yep. What do you see looking forward as the kind of companies that will become utilities in the future? Yep. We've got one investment in this region, right? Mm. Henry. Yeah. And I don't think I could find a better example of a utility. Here you are, a sole proprietor. You just said, you know what? Screw my company. I'm going to go off on my own, right? I'm going to be a yoga instructor or a carpet cleaner or a house painter or just a digital marketer. And then you get a notice from the government and they say, you owe taxes. And you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know how many taxes I own. You know, whatever it is, really complex, stressful problem. And here's a company that rolls along and they say, hey, don't stress about it. Hook up into Henry. We'll automatically calculate, pay your taxes, automated bookkeeping. You pay us 1% of your earnings. Easy. I mean, that's just easy. That's a utility. Henry's retention is incredible. And they only serve sole proprietors, right? So despite serving single person businesses, they have amazing retention. That's a perfect example of a utility. So I try to find utilities like that. The last investment I closed was a company... Um, in the property tax negotiation space, right? Mm -hmm. So you own your home, that's your biggest asset. And every year, the state government or the local government tells you how much you owe in taxes. But how do they calculate that? Do they calculate it correctly? I don't know. Well, this company goes to you and they say, hey, we will automatically fight for you. And you get 75% of the savings, we'll take 25%. Companies like that are utilities and that's what we look for. Yeah. Yeah. Should we go quick fires? Yeah. Um, Vinny, there's like probably 200 more questions that we could ask, but we know that we're very um, crutch for time. So I've added a few more questions into the quick fires. And basically what we do here, we're going to ask you a bunch of questions and yep. you're going to have 30 seconds each to answer them. All right, cool. Cool. What's one of your favorite books and why? I really like the book 10 Drugs uh, because it, it shows the evolution of the mar modern pharmaceutical industry, starting with opium and then bringing us into present day you know, stuff like Oxycontin. Mm. And I find that to be fascinating because mm. in some ways it's so old, but in some ways it's very, very new. You should check out the TV show Dope Sick if you oh, want I've to learn it. more about yeah. Incredible. Love it. Incredible. Yeah. What's one of your favorite podcasts and why? You know, I never have told him this, but I love my brother's podcast, <laughs> Business Breakdowns. I genuinely, yeah. I find it fascinating yeah. because I love to know about businesses and it's all I watch, it's all I read about. And so he breaks down businesses that I'm specifically interested in and I think my favorite episode was the one about the NFL, the, yeah. the American Football I League. I going to say the episode you did on it. <laughs> well, yeah, second favorite. <laughs> yeah. We're big fans of Invest Like the Best and everything that comes under the banner. From oh, nice. From business breakdowns to founders podcast. Incredible empire they're creating. Who would be your favorite dinner guest that you could get if you could get anyone living or dead? I am very allergic to mediocrity. And the other side of that is I have a huge respect for dedication to excellence and uh, because of that there's a there's a short list of people but it would be the michael jordans or even like the the jiro from jiro dreams of sushi like just people who are dedicated to their craft and care about just being the best because i love that energy mm, that's awesome what's been the luckiest thing that's ever happened to you being born into my family i mean honestly like when I would go back to India as a kid and I would see the level of poverty there and I'm like, man, you're like genetically, you're 99.99% the same as me. And you're here begging for, uh, you know, anything on the ground and you're, you're mistreated and all this stuff. It's, it's rough, but very good perspective to get as a kid of how lucky you are. And I'm just incredibly lucky to be born in the time and the country to the family and everything I was. Cool. I got... Three more. Um, where did the name Left Lane come from? We were on our way to one of our first LP meetings. 
And at the time we were just calling ourselves Farsight Capital, which I think was a terrible name. Um, but we got into the high occupancy vehicle lane and we were able to pass all the traffic. Now here it doesn't really work, but in the U S <laughs> the left lane is a passing lane, but we thought it was beautiful that we actually made it to the meeting on time and we're able to pass traffic because we were multiple people in the car together. Being together and moving faster was an amazing idea to start with. And frankly, we were just able to negotiate with the guy who owned leftlanecap.com and, <laughs> and we bought it for, I think, I don't know, 13 grand. Did that LP invest in you? That, no. That many? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. Um, what's a misconception that people have about you? Oh, wow. That's a good one. Um, a lot of people think that I'm very mean because I tend to not smile in photos. I purposely do that. Is that from the rap days? You want to oh, yeah, it? 100%. <laughs> I don't show the teeth in photos. So much so that finally uh, our, our head of Platform America, our VP of Platform America said, hey, please smile in this photo that we're going to put on the website. So I smiled in the photo. But uh, when they meet me, they're like, oh, you never stop smiling. I'm like, yeah, I'm super happy. Why wouldn't I smile? They're like, well, in all your photos, you're not smiling. Well, I'm like, yeah, I want you to be scared of me before you meet me. <laughs> All right, last question. If you could send a text message to everyone in the world, what would it say? Have a great day. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. I've never thought about that before. Um, but I, actually what I would probably write in the text message would be, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. Mm. Enjoy it. Mm. Love beautiful. that. Great way I, to finish the episode. I'm going I'm to ask one more because we talked about this a bit before the episode. Yeah. Um, obviously, you could talk about this for a long time, but how has your wife influenced you? Oh, man. We call her the professional human in our family. <laughs> so she has no oh. cognitive dissonance between, oh, I should be doing this thing and I am doing this thing. Right. So once she learns that a food is unhealthy for her, she never eats it again. Wow. Period. Unbelievable. I'm the exact opposite. I'm like, I'm lactose intolerant, but I eat pizza four times a week. Right? <laughs> um, she has made me a lot more purposeful. And I'd say that thanks to her, I sleep more. I work out more. I eat healthier. Um, and I mean, yeah, she's just made me the best version of myself. You sound like a awesome. bit of a dysfunctional human before you met her. <laughs> I, I'd say that I was smart and I was hardworking, yeah. but that's kind of all I had going for me. Yeah. She kind of made me into like a, a healthy human being. Yeah, wow. That's great. Yeah. Our couple. This has been awesome, Vinny. Um, we will do a round two at some stage in the future, but yeah. um, thanks for coming on. Yeah, yeah thanks for having me, Thanks guys. for coming on and welcome to Australia again. <laughs> thanks.